on this episode of In the Fight. We get a behind the scenes look at how the US military is taking on the daunting task of moving equipment and supplies out of Afghanistan. US and Afghan forces continue to battle the Taliban on the front lines. Soldiers help locals battle disease throughout Uganda. Service members from all branches of the military compete in the Warrior Games. And an airman talks about his inspiration for joining the Air Force. Next year, all combat troops are slated to leave Afghanistan and return home. As the U.S. military draws down, it is faced with a delicate balance of bringing back equipment, weapons, and vehicles, while making sure our service members are equipped with the tools they need to continue the mission. Army broadcasting correspondent Gail McCabe takes us to Bagram Airfield to show us the behind-the-scenes process of bringing military resources back to the States. The fighting season is in its early stages. Afghans are taking the lead, but good strategy says our forces need to be equipped right up to the end. The challenge now is that our fighting units are still out there fighting. Again, a difference between Afghanistan and Iraq. Major General Kurt Stein commands the 1st Theater Sustainment Command, charged with retrograde oversight. And so our units need that equipment. We can't take it out of their hands and expect them to, to, to do their mission. In the meanwhile, Stein says they are adapting, looking for ways to lessen the overall volume and cost of materiel moved out of theater, while also adjusting to unknowns that will undoubtedly determine the final outcome. What is known is the pace of retrograde will continue to ramp up as the final drawdown gets closer. Sustainment stock, right. our project stock. Bagram Airfield is one of two primary retrograde sites where reclaiming U.S. military materiel is an ongoing mission. The work at Bagram and Kandahar down south is a team effort. From battle space owner to the 401st Army Field Support Brigade to individual augmentees, part of the CENTCOM material retrograde element, CMRE. Soldiers like Sergeant Eric Hill, Hill is part of an ammo abatement team. Every vehicle that comes into our pad is checked multiple times for any kind of ammo. One of every 10 vehicles will find either spin casings, a uh, few live rounds. The inspections are very thorough. Every crack, cable, and crevice is checked and rechecked again. Hill says it's like touching history. Because the, these vehicles are coming from outside the wire, so uh, we, we know that there's, there's stories attached to every piece of ammunition we find. Since last December, the ammo abatement team has scoured well over 2,300 vehicles like this MRAP. It's estimated 20,000 more will be stripped down and checked by the end of 2014. Inside 60-foot warehouses, redistribution property accountability, or RPAT, is a 24-7 operation. The key word is accountability. The RPAT team handles all rolling stock, anything that moves, and other property book items, things typically associated with vehicles. Once here, it's stripped down, evaluated, and entered into a supported chain of custody that follows every piece that comes through. Each item is touched, identified, and coded, processed for eventual entry into the Army Reset Program for use by soldiers in the next fight. We have recovered 1.1 million pieces of final installation property we have bought back to record. We're saving a lot of money for the taxpayers. That's what it's all about. If you look at six months ago, 
you know, there was a lot more stuff. So whenever you come, you're going to see stuff. And that's a good news story, that you see it in this yard. You don't see it out in the fighting positions. You don't see them out in the fobs. You see it in a controlled area, already accounted for, picked up for record, getting ready to move back to the United States. So that's a success story. A big part of the retrograde mission is cleaning. If it's destined for the states, it travels through customs. The big stuff hits the wash racks. Anything less than large gets checked out here. We don't want any type of infection or anything that goes in, like any pitchable dirt. We don't want any of that stuff going back into the states. The end should be clean to where when it goes back to the states and it is unpacked, it is ready to be put back into the system. It's all part of a system guided by cost, keeping what can be reused, shedding what's no longer of value. This is where we get our money back right here, absolutely. Like there's lots of money. So money. We get lots of money, yes, absolutely. I think we're uh, upwards of 100 million. It's estimated $36 billion of inventory will be removed from Afghanistan by the end of 2014 at a cost of $6 billion. What's also known is the retrograde process is evolving. The big push is yet to begin. But according to the first TSC commander, there is a known deadline, and logisticians are confident that it can be met. We got tremendous uh, people in the right place at the right time, and the processes and the procedures are in place. So I think we're OK. Gil McCabe, Afghanistan. Hello, this is Lance Corporal Sarah Diamond with 4th Medical Battalion in Agadir, Morocco. I just thought I'd send some love to my mom, Tina Canella, in Temecula, California. Mom, I love you, I hope you're safe, and I'll be home soon. Hi, my name is Captain Eric North, stationed with the 101st Airborne Division at Bagram, Afghanistan. I would just like to tell my wife, Janine North, in Daphne, Alabama, happy anniversary. I love you, baby. Hi, I'm Captain Brian Reynolds with Task Force Alans. I just want to send a shout out to my little soldier, Nicholas, and my little princess, Ariana. Daddy loves you. And a shout out to my wife. Love you, Rohana. This is Major Jay Hardy in Bagram, Afghanistan with the 101st Airborne Division. I'd like to wish my wife, Krista Hardy, in Clarksville, Tennessee, a happy birthday. I love you, I miss you, and I'll see you soon. Coming up, U.S. and Afghan forces continue to battle the Taliban on the front lines of Afghanistan and service members battle diseases throughout Uganda. Check out DividTub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. What is the Department of Defense's estimated cost to return or transfer equipment from Afghanistan? The answer when we return. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband, to my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend. To my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan. To my family out in Tucson, Arizona. To my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa. To everybody in Texas. In York, Pennsylvania. Colorado Springs, Colorado. Chicago, Illinois. Harrisonburg, Virginia. Orlando, Florida. Oceanside, California. And Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys. I miss you. And I hope I'll see you soon. What is the Department of Defense's estimated cost to return or transfer equipment from Afghanistan? The answer is B, $5.7 billion. 
As the U.S. military continues to pack up for its slated exit from Afghanistan, U.S. and Afghan forces are still on the front lines battling the Taliban. Army Specialist Tim Morgan heads out on a mission with the 23rd Infantry Regiment and brings us this story. Tell you what, three, two, Vic, just send up your current grid and uh, tell them we're taking indirect at that point. Break. Today's mission is one of the last that infantry soldiers from Aztec Company 2nd Infantry Division will conduct before their upcoming redeployment. Wanna go check it out? Yeah, do, let's do it. With the Afghan army leading the way, soldiers searched key villages in Zabul province for weapon and explosive caches. Right now, we're just searching through a Hotec village trying to figure out if there's that HME lab here and also a spotter bed down location. I think we found our spotter bed down location and also our spotters, but they jumped into a Perez and we're trying to fish them out right now. Within minutes of their arrival, suspected Taliban spotters fled the scene. A chase then began that led soldiers directly into unknown territory. Like sprint down here as fast as he could. He jumped that wall and did the same thing he did, kind of got down. And once we came over here, we discovered there was a Karez, a hole, and uh, we saw footprints. At the opening to the end of the tunnel, Aztec Company found themselves in the middle of a homemade explosive lab. We found two black bags, uh, suspected HME, and then we also found one AK-47. Aztec Company then called for explosive ordnance disposal. We're probably gonna bring our small dismount robot on. We're gonna have it pull at these bags and see what happens. Better to be remote than have somebody as a person stand on top of it and get hurt. Once explosive ordnance disposal deemed it safe, soldiers found four IEDs and several bags of potassium chlorate. The search for caches today was a success. However, Aztec Company had one last obstacle. We're just getting ready to exfil, walking past uh, to the truck, and uh, right in front of me is a buried yellow jug. On the way to his vehicle, a soldier spotted an IED just footsteps away. EOD marked it as a 50-pound IED, large enough to cause catastrophic damage. Reporting from Zabul Province, Afghanistan, I'm Army Specialist Tim Morgan. The Army believes that no matter the soldier's specialty, they should all be taught the same basic procedures and skill sets so they are ready to properly work together to defend themselves and their fellow soldiers. Army Sergeant Nate Bowen joins a training exercise and files this report. We went ahead and passed checkpoint two to checkpoint three. These finance soldiers are out here conducting pre-deployment training for their upcoming missions downrange later this year. Some will go to Kuwait and others to Afghanistan. Regardless of where they're going though, their leaders want to know they'll be prepared for anything. We may not necessarily be the drivers or conducting the convoys, but the opportunity is always there. If we need to jump in, you know, a place of someone, assist a gunner, assist anyone in the vehicle, we need to have that training so we're successful and can get that mission accomplished. To that end, they're conducting convoy training learning the ropes of positions from driver to gunner, engaging targets on the move, and finally hitting a simulated IED lane. Although the training brings up a lot of unfamiliar territory, the soldiers are adapting and learning as it comes. Uh, they're doing great. The, uh, the morale's up right now. They're really motivated and uh, ready to accomplish any task at a given time. And uh, all the soldiers have adapted quickly, uh, stayed positive about it, and executed the training really well. They wrap up the lane with a simulated medevac, working together as a unit to get the casualty on the helicopter in time. For the Rainier Report, I'm Army Sergeant Nate Bowen. Marines need to be prepared to roll out at a moment's notice. This preparedness only comes about through continuous training over and over again. Marine Corporal Joseph Scanlon hopped aboard a light armored vehicle to bring us this story. Marines of 1st Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion drove down to Marine Corps Air Station Miramar to take their expeditionary capabilities to the sky during a training exercise April 22nd with C-17 Globemasters. We're conducting a strategic mobile exercise. Pretty much it's uh, identifying the ability to quickly uh, load up on aircraft and uh, be able to respond to any uh, incidents that are happening worldwide. The exercise was designed to teach Marines the basic skills involved with loading and unloading their LAVs from an aircraft, making 1st LAR a more mobile force. 
Well, I think you've heard it uh, a lot from Congress all the way through the Commandant about us being the most prepared when the country is least prepared, and this is part of that process. Uh, this is our ability to rapidly deploy uh, and be able to plan usually within one to two weeks and be able to be in theater somewhere within uh, a few days in, in an operational status. Whether flying into a combat zone or to an allied nation for humanitarian support, First Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion stands ready for whatever mission comes their way. Reporting from Camp Pendleton, California, I'm Corporal Joseph Scanlon. Soldiers from Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa are serving in the epicenter of the latest outbreak of the Ebola virus. Air Force Tech Sergeant John Ledoux brings us this story about a group of healthcare workers striving to make a difference. There are parts of the world where survival comes only by the hands and hearts of the people who strive for it. But without technology and proper knowledge, that survival is sometimes threatened by disease. Such is the case in Luero, Uganda, where U.S. service members are working to help local health officials identify symptoms of such problematic diseases. This village had an uh, outbreak of Ebola in 2012, in November. So we chose this area for the One Health mission. The One Health program educates Ugandan people and animal health care workers on a wide array of topics to include sanitation and disease identification and prevention. Oh, like papaya, see it? Yes, it's oh. there. In a partnership with the Ugandan government, the U.S. State Department, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, the service members from Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa worked with village health care teams and soldiers of the Uganda People's Defense Force to check up with residents of the Luero District. This is the epicenter, or the tip of the spear as we speak, of where that outbreak took place last year. The information that's going to come from this will be collated and we will analyze it with the class and then we will make recommendations to the citizens of this small village as to what they can do to prevent another outbreak from happening in the future. The teams made progress in checking with residents of the nearly 200 homes in the village, but for the sake of the people here, there is much more that can be done. I'm really looking forward to continuing this One Health mission because this is something that is really needed here. It is very, I, I'm, I, there's no words can explain what I'm feeling right now. Reporting for Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa Public Affairs, I'm Tech Sergeant John Ledoux. Hi, my name is Corporal Cody Burdick with 4th Land Support Battalion in Agadir, Morocco. I'd like to give a special shout out to my mother, Sherry, in Florence, South Carolina. Love you, Ma. See you soon. Hi, I'm Staff Sergeant uh, Greg Infante, uh, stationed at uh, Camp Buring, Kuwait. I'd like to give a shout out to my daughter, Brittany, who's graduating high school. Love you, kiddo, and I'm uh, proud of you. We'll see you soon. Hi, my name is Specialist Joshua Preble with Task Force Salons uh, from Salem, Morgan. I just want to say hi to everyone back home, my mom, my sister, and my dad. Hey, my name is Lance Corporal Ryan Edgerly with Fox Battery, 2nd Battalion, 14th Marine Regiment in Agadir, Morocco. I'd like to give a special shout out to my mom, Margie Delgado in Lawton, Oklahoma. Hey mom, love you, miss you, be home soon. Hi, my name is Sergeant First Class Ronald Williams, stationed in Bagram, Afghanistan with the 101st Airborne Division. I would like to tell the Williams and Clark family in New Orleans, Louisiana, that I love and miss you all. Take care. Coming up, service members from all branches of the military compete in the Warrior Games. And we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. What year was the U.S. Army Air Corps disbanded? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divids, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7.
What year was the U.S. Army Air Corps disbanded? The answer is B, 1947. The Warrior Games showcases the resilient spirit of today's wounded, ill, or injured service members from all branches of the military. After overcoming significant physical and behavioral injuries, these men and women demonstrate the power of ability over disability and the spirit of competition. Marine Corporal Max Pennington brings us this story. As you inspire all of us, we win by being in your presence. The U.S. Olympic Committee kicked off the 2013 Warrior Games during an opening ceremony at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. The dignified guest included Prince Harry, four-time Olympic gold medalist Missy Franklin, and the Commandant and Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. The Warrior Games is a Paralympic-style competition for wounded or ill service members and veterans athletes from all branches of the U.S. military and British forces go head-to-head -head in track and field, cycling, swimming, archery, shooting, sitting volleyball, and wheelchair basketball. The Marine team has won the Warrior Games Chairman's Cup the last three years. Uh, the expectations uh, from the Marines is to definitely come here, uh, play at your hardest, give it 110 uh, percent, and let them know that, you know, that we remain and will always be the best. They were selected during the Marine Corps trials held in Camp Pendleton, California in February. The defending champions went through a two-week training camp in Colorado to help acclimate to the climate. Reporting for the Wounded Warrior Regiment, I'm Corporal Max Pennington. Every airman has a different reason for joining the Air Force. Some join for the education benefits, while others join for a steady job. Airman First Class Stephen Ellis introduces us to one Hurlburt Field Major who found his motivation within his own history. Box, clock, stop. When Major Mike Engelhardt decided to join the military and eventually Box, become a pilot, it wasn't movies stop. like Top Gun that fueled him to fly, nor did his inspiration lie in the Air Force itself. Instead, it came from his grandfather. Growing up as a kid, I just watching my grandfather and his sense of pride in this country. Uh, I, I can tell you, it didn't matter what the weather was, what the conditions were. Every morning, he was outside raising his flag and taking it down every night. At 91 years old, Henry J. Denicola has seen and experienced more than most. But the lasting imprint that he left on his grandson began when Denicola enlisted in the Army Air Corps in December of 1941. I heard President Roosevelt on that Sunday when I was washing pots and pans in a fraternity house at Cornell University, and I heard of this day shall live in infamy. The Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. My buddy and I told the chef goodbye. About four days later, I signed up. For three years, Mr. Denicola served as a nose gunner aboard the B-24 Liberator. He flew 13 combat missions. We had a mission uh, from Samar, and uh, we were the fourth B-24 to take off from a landing strip uh, on Samar, a dirt strip. And the first plane took off, and the uh, second plane took off, and the third plane took off, and made a right turn out and exploded. Just exploded. You could see it. Four of my best buddies were on that plane and they died. We got the signal to just take off. We took off. Denicola says he'll never forget that day, but it's all the memories and the experience gained that have made him who he is. They are the cornerstone that built the foundation for his children and his grandchildren alike. I will tell them that you live in the greatest country in the world, the United States of America. There's no country like this. No, no other country in the world can match our country. And that they love it very deeply and sincerely and be ready to serve it if it calls for them. That's what I want my children to be. Here's one of them right here. As for Major Engelhardt, Introducing his own legacy to his grandfather was an honor. Uh, seeing the pride he had in his eyes for, for what I do and for what all the airmen here at Earlbert and the Air Force do, uh, you saw this uh, 
just, just this, this spark in him. Two men, two generations apart, but as one family, they're building a legacy in their own right for our airmen past, present, and future. Airman First Class Stephen Ellis, Herbert Field, Florida. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at DividsHub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at DividsHub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divis has to offer. As we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight.